Part 1. You will hear a conversation between a man and a woman as the woman buys a new bus pass. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Good morning, madam. How can I help you? Hi there. My name's Louise. I need to get a new bus pass. Do you know which zones you'll need it for? Yes. Zones 1, 2 and 3. That's fine. Now, have you had a bus pass before? Yes. I've had one for the last six months and it expired today. That's good. I won't need to take your details then. I'll need to confirm some information though. That's fine. Can you let me know your postcode? It's NW13. 4SG. And can you let me know the number of the house at that postcode? It's number 13. I've got your records here. It says that we should contact you on your mobile phone. Is that still right? I'd like to change that actually to email. I've not changed it, so you should have my current address. Let's see. Is it Louise K at UKNet.com? That's right. OK, I've made a note of that. I won't get extra spam, will I? No, don't worry. Our data policy specifies that we can't pass on your information to anyone or contact you without good reason. Good. Thank you. Now, on your old bus pass, there was no photo. The new one will be a photo card. Do you have a photo with you? No, I don't. I didn't know that I would need it. That's OK. We put the requirement on the website, but of course most people don't see it. I can take it here if you like. Just look at this screen. Like this? That's right. Now, keep still. OK, that's done. By the way, is the price still £100? I'm afraid not. The price went up by 5%. It's still pretty good value, though. Yes, that's fine. So, here's your new pass and here's a new holder. I saw that your old one had got a bit worn. Yes, it had. Thanks very much. The old one had gotten a bit beaten up, being at the bottom of my bag all the time. One more thing. I noticed there was no signature on the back of your old bus pass. It isn't valid without it, so you'd better do that now to your new one. Oh, I didn't know that either. I'll do it now. There you are. Before the conversation continues, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen carefully and answer questions 6 to 10. Is there anything else I can help you with? Yes, there is, actually. You know that all the bus routes have been reorganised recently? Yes. Well, I'm a bit confused. Could you briefly explain some of the changes? Of course. First of all, there is Route 1. That's the one that goes in the direction of the town hospital when it goes north and the university when it goes south. There are two bus stops where you can get on this. To go north, you need to find bus stop Q. That's on Alton Road, just outside the town hall. To go south, towards the university, then find bus stop P, which is also on Alton Road, outside the cinema. That's useful for me, as I study at the university. Now I live in West Howe. What will I need to do to get a Route 1 bus? The best way is to go to the town centre and change. You'll need to take Route 3. Take the bus from the centre of West Howe and get off at the town centre at bus stop G. That's outside Westgate Shopping Centre. Then, to get back to West Howe, you'll need to go back to Westgate Shopping Centre and find bus stop H, opposite bus stop G. Thanks. Finally, I need to know how to get to the Arrowdown Sports Centre. I was given a membership there, and so I'll be going there quite often too. First of all, you need to come to the centre of town as you would normally. Then, to get to that sports centre, you'll need to go to the town centre post office. The buses for the Arrowdown centre are from bus stop A. 
To get back, take the bus from outside the sports centre and get off at bus stop C in the town centre. Thanks for that. Now, a friend told me that I can get discounts using my bus pass. He said that I can get cheaper cinema tickets and train tickets with it. I'm afraid not with the cinema, but you'll get a 15% discount on local train services. There are other possibilities as well. The local football club gives you access to the special hospitality area, although you'll need to buy a regular ticket. You can also get priority seating at the local theatre and the local museum gives bus pass holders cheaper entry. Some of these things are restricted by availability, of course. Well, that's a bonus. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a man giving an information talk at an adult education centre. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen carefully to the information talk and answer questions 11 to 15. Good evening everyone and thanks for coming to this information evening at the Adult Education Centre. My name is Mike and I'll be speaking to you for a short while before you can go and explore the various departments that we have here. The centre was founded 50 years ago by the Town Council in order to help people who had failed to get a proper education when they were children. The idea today is a little different. We can give people the chance to study what they missed at school, for whatever reason, but we can also just give them training in everyday skills, or just allow them to extend themselves. The teachers in the centre are fully qualified, and their teaching is appraised every six months by inspectors from the Ministry of Education. Our teachers have the latest teaching aids and accessories, from interactive whiteboards to computer labs with the most up-to-date technology. All our teachers undergo special training, and all their lessons can be found online at what we call the Interactive Classroom, which is accessible by all registered students. All notes, videos and worksheets can be found there, so if you miss a lesson, you can catch up on your computer at home. As well as just finding the resources, you can be in direct contact with your teacher. Naturally, he or she cannot be online all day, but every teacher has two online tutorial sessions of three hours each, when they are available to chat. They can, of course, be in demand, so they are limited to four students at any one time, and students can only interact with their teacher for a maximum of ten minutes. If the teacher is free, though, students may continue to chat for longer. Naturally, we also have a normal website. This has details of all our courses, teachers, fees and timetables. All courses can be booked and paid for online, although you'll need, of course, to supply credit card or bank account details. If you don't want to book online, you'll need to come to our main centre on Langdon Street between the hours of 10am and 2pm, which are the hours that our administration section is open to the general public. You now have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen to the rest of the information talk and answer questions 16 to 20. Now, let me tell you a little about the courses that we have on offer. I'll begin with languages, as they're often very popular. 
we offer a variety of European languages, including French, German, Polish and Spanish. In addition, we offer Arabic, Korean, Japanese and Mandarin Chinese. These languages are offered at various stages of ability, and to find out which class you belong in, you can do our self-assessment test, available on our website for all the languages we offer. Next, I'd like to tell you about our business-related courses. Our business courses vary from short morning or afternoon sessions, where you will develop an excellent understanding of a particular topic, to courses that run for over 30 weeks, where you can achieve an industry-recognised qualification. From learning how to use essential computer software to bookkeeping or search engine optimization and website development, we have the business courses to help you achieve your goals. These courses are always the most popular, so if you're interested, make sure you make your booking fast. We only take 10 people per course and these places go quickly. One of our most popular course areas is photography and computers for photography. Our range of courses on these subjects can help you learn to get the most out of your camera. From basic to advanced, our courses will allow you to build up your knowledge and learn new ways to use your equipment. Another favourite are our cooking courses. We offer speciality courses, but a favourite is our introduction to cooking. This course is ideal for those new to cooking, or for anyone wishing to create achievable and inspiring dishes. Learn a variety of essential cooking techniques to help you create simple, everyday dishes, or some more elaborate things to impress your guests. You will also learn to make the best use of store cupboard ingredients, and how to take delicious shortcuts to make cooking quick and enjoyable every day. I'll finish with telling you about our creative writing course. It looks at practical ways to get started, whilst promoting greater writing confidence. The focus of this course is placed on practical exercises, supported by discussion and examples, and builds upon the strengths of each writer. It will give you an insight into the creative process and encourage you to achieve your writing goals. Our creative writing course provides an opportunity for all aspiring writers to develop the skills for writing fiction. We have lots more courses, and I urge you to check our website, as we don't have enough time to introduce everything that we have on offer. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear four students discussing a survey that they will conduct. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. Hi Martin, hi Rachel, are you both waiting for us? Hi Abby, hi Lance, yes we are, but we've not been waiting long. Yes, we just ordered some coffee. Hi Lance. Hi everyone. So we're here today to talk about our survey on electronics and communications. Rachel, you said you were going to think about some question ideas. That's right. I've been looking at our subject of how household citizens in this country derive benefit from the digital environment. To start with, I thought we could ask about their perceptions of internet speed. Dial-up or broadband? Broadband, I think, Lance. Not many people in this country have dial-up anymore. I think that's a great start, Rachel. It's very topical at the moment. What about after that? Another important area is people's perceptions of affordability. This has a lot to do whether people have travelled to different countries and have seen the costs of services there and are therefore able to compare what they pay for here. That's not necessarily true, Rachel. People can have perceptions of affordability without having to have travelled. 
That's true, Lance. I like the idea, Rachel, but let's keep the travel part out of it. If we include that, we could create too much bias within the answers, as people who don't travel wouldn't be able to answer. You're both right. I'll just make a note of that. Now, the next area I looked at was what people think about the possibility of changing subscriptions and switching between providers. I thought it wasn't possible to just switch providers. Aren't people locked in with a contract? Yes, they are usually, but even within the contracts there are ways of cancelling and changing provider. There's also a lot of talk in the media about how many contracts demand three-month notice periods. People often don't realise that, and they're furious when they have to wait and pay for three further months. Yes, I know someone in that position. They're actually leaving the country, and they have to continue paying their communications bill for two months, when they're not even in the country or living at the address that the contract deals with. Well, we should get some good feedback and answers on that area. So, my next area is the transparency of tariff information. Again, this is a topical area in the communications industry. That's right. There were some big stories in the media recently. The government has clamped down on companies not disclosing this. I read a story last week about a family that sued their phone provider for not giving the proper information. The family won, and it seems the government has finally woken up about this matter and will do something about it. Why is it so important? It's because companies want people to choose the package that gives them the most profit. It doesn't matter to them that people don't get the deal that makes the most sense for them. Salespeople just give customers a limited number of options, and customers can't find the full information anywhere else. That's awful. I can't believe they can get away with that nowadays. I know. Fortunately, things are getting better, though. So, the last area is about uh, mobile phone usage. Will we just be looking at how often people use their mobile phones? Not so much that. We'll be more interested in how happy customers are with their signal reception. That's a good topic, too. I thought that we had good coverage in this country, but then I heard from some foreign student friends of mine that it's terrible here and that their countries are much better. That's right. We think it's okay here, as we're used to nothing different. You now have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen to the rest of the discussion and answer questions 27 to 30. So next we have to decide when and where to do our survey. I think the best thing would be to go after lectures on Wednesday morning. We'd get the afternoon shoppers and we'd get it all done before dinner. The problem with that is we'd only get people free on a weekday afternoon. There would be a lot of unemployed people and that would influence the results. On a Saturday afternoon, we'd get a lot more people and a better cross-section of society. I don't really want to lose my Saturday, though. Nor do I. I want to go to the football. Can't we do Friday afternoon? There'll be lots of people around off work early then. Well, that would be better than Wednesday, but I think Rachel's right. Nobody wants to work at weekends. But if we want to do a good job with this survey, then we should make some sacrifices. OK. Yes, I suppose the football can wait. Now, are we sure that the town centre is the best place to conduct our survey? What do you think, Rachel? Well, it's the place where we'd find the most people. Also, we'd probably find the best cross-section of society there. The trouble, as I see it, is that some people won't want to be stopped to answer our questions. You know what it's like. That's true. But that will be the same wherever we go. The other places where we'd find lots of people could be worse. In train and bus stations, people would be busy. I think Rachel's idea about the town centre is best. What about in the central shopping mall? Again, maybe there would be too many of a certain type of people. OK, I'm fine with Rachel's idea. Me too, I'm happy. Finally, we need to analyse the information as fast as possible. Why don't you all come round to my place the next day and we can collate everything and do some statistical analysis? Can you make that, Lance? I can't after three o'clock. I have to be with my family then. 
I could come before that or in the evening. How about you, Rachel? That should be no problem for me, as I'm free all day. So just let me know when. What about you, Martin? It might be a problem for me, I'm afraid. I can come, but not in the evening. I've got tickets to the cinema. Let's meet at midday, then. We should be able to get everything done in a couple of hours so Lance can get away. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a lecture on geothermal energy. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Hello everyone and welcome to this lecture on renewable energy resources. Today we're going to look at geothermal energy and we'll look at the country of Iceland to see how this energy type has been exploited there. Geothermal energy is the heat from the earth. It's clean and sustainable. Resources of geothermal energy range from the shallow ground to hot water and hot rock found a few miles beneath the Earth's surface and down even deeper to the layer of extremely high temperature magma. This layer of magma continually produces heat, mostly from the decay of naturally radioactive materials such as uranium and potassium. The amount of heat within 10,000 meters of Earth's surface contains 50,000 times more energy than all the oil and natural gas resources in the world. Iceland is a pioneer in the use of geothermal energy for space heating. Generating electricity with geothermal energy has also increased significantly in recent years. Geothermal power facilities currently generate 25% of the country's total electricity output. Last year, roughly 84% of primary energy use in Iceland came from indigenous renewable resources, of which 66% was geothermal. During the course of the 20th century, Iceland went from what was one of Europe's lowest income countries, dependent upon peat and imported coal for its energy, to a country with a premier standard of living, where most energy is derived from renewable resources. The cheap source of energy created this change. Iceland is a young country geologically. It lies astride one of the Earth's major fault lines, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. This is the boundary between the North American and Eurasian tectonic plates. The two plates are moving apart at a rate of about two centimeters per year. Iceland is an anomalous part of the ridge where deep mantle material wells up and creates a hot spot of unusually great volcanic productivity. This makes Iceland one of the few places on Earth where one can see an active spreading ridge above sea level. As a result of its location, Iceland is one of the most geologically active places on Earth, resulting in a large number of volcanoes and hot springs. Earthquakes are also frequent, but rarely cause serious damage. More than 200 volcanoes are located within the active volcanic zone, stretching through the country from the southwest to the northeast and at least 30 of them have erupted since the country was settled. A lot of Iceland's geothermal energy comes from hot water or steam, and these are found in two types of water temperature systems, high temperature fields and low temperature fields. High temperature fields are located within the active volcanic zones or marginal to them. They are mostly on high ground and the rocks are geologically very young and permeable. As a result of the topography and high bedrock permeability, the groundwater table in the high temperature areas is generally deep and surface manifestations are largely steam vents. The low temperature fields are all located outside the volcanic zone passing through Iceland 
The largest examples of these systems are located in southwest Iceland, on the flanks of the western volcanic zone, but smaller systems can be found throughout the country. On the surface, low temperature activity is manifested in hot or boiling springs, although no surface indications are observed on top of some such systems. Flow rates range from almost zero to a maximum of 180 litres per second from a single spring. Scientists believe these low temperature fields are transient, lasting some thousands of years. You have some time to look at question. There are three ways to create electricity with geothermal energy. Hydrothermal using hot water, geopressurized using a hydraulic turbine, and petrothermal using superheated dry rock to create steam when water is pumped into it. In Iceland, generating electricity with geothermal energy has increased significantly in recent years. And as a result of a rapid expansion in Iceland's energy intensive industry, the demand for electricity has increased considerably. One of the most common electricity generation methods in Iceland is with a geothermal plant, which brings heat up to the surface, where it is brought into contact with water. This creates high-pressure steam, which is then piped to drive turbines. The pipes and turbines must be extremely strong in order to stop the corrosive steam from bursting out and causing a danger to workers. The turbines in turn create the electromagnetic field within a generator that creates electricity. The electricity generated is then transferred out to a local substation before being directed to its place of end use. Back at the geothermal plant, the steam that has been through the turbines is piped away. The steam is then allowed to condense in a cooling tower. Warm air and vapour is released into the air and the leftover hot water is piped away for a variety of other direct heat uses, such as house heating, agriculture, fish farms and industry. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Yeah.